Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Pig Health Today, and with me is Dr. Marissa Rotolo. She is a veterinarian and a postdoctoral research associate at Iowa State University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, I know you've been doing some research on PERS, but specifically you've been doing it on spatial autocorrelation. I have to ask, what is spatial autocorrelation? Because I think that's a term that might even be new to some veterinarians in this industry. Right, so spatial autocorrelation is based off of Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So in swine terms, or how we would apply it to swine farms, is pens near each other are more likely to have the same disease status than pens farther apart. Pens, pigs in the same pens are more likely to have the same disease status than pigs in a different pen. So it's just looking at how disease uh, correlates with location in a farm. And how do you measure spatial autocorrelation? There are a multitude of ways you can do it. There's different modeling approaches you can do. We can, I personally use a program called ArcMap and Geoda. It's a program that community and regional planning companies will use. Um, it's a type of GIS technology, geographical information systems. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it measures the distance in between your two points to figure out if they're correlated. And you can also um, use, it's called Moran's eye, it's the coefficient for spatial autocorrelation. So it's kind of like R if you're trying to measure regression. So it's from zero to one. And if you have spatial autocorrelation, then you're gonna have a Moran's eye that's obviously above zero. So there's a lot of science going on here. Walk bit. me through how this is going to work with helping the industry get a better handle on PERS. Basically what we can use spatial autocorrelation for is we can see how pens are related to each other and try to extrapolate that relationship to figure out how we can better sample. Uh, one of the things that we discovered, part of my research, is looking at probability of detection using oral fluids. So if you're taking eight samples, what's your probability of detection for PERS? Um, and then one of the big things is how should you sample? Should you do simple random sampling? So just collecting samples randomly throughout the barns or should you do this new type of sampling which is called fixed spatial sampling in which you would collect samples equidistant from each other. The reason that spatial autocorrelation comes into effect is if you have spatial autocorrelation in your data set in your PERS um, PCR results or ELISA results or any influenza, any sort of pathogen that you can pick up um, depending on what diagnostic assay you have, if you have spatial autocorrelation in that data set, then you want to use a fixed spatial sampling approach. So it shows that fixed spatial sampling might actually be a better approach for swine surveillance or monitoring projects as opposed to simple random sampling, which is, has been our old standby. Now, in the past, they've always used ropes. They would get the animals to chew on ropes and, mm -hmm. and you'd get the fluid sample that way. Is it, you're still taking the same approach? Yeah, we're still doing that. Uh, you place one rope in one pen or you can place multiple ropes in a pen and the pigs will chew on it. Um, Give them about 20 to 30 minutes to chew on the rope, make contact with it, use a white cotton rope, depending on the age of the pig. If you want to, if they're older pigs, you want to use a thicker rope, like 5 eighths. If they're a little bit younger, you want to go with 3 eighths or half an inch. Mm -hmm. um, give them 20, 30 minutes to chew on it, and you've got your sample. So again, once we have these samples, and so we've had the rope samples before, mm -hmm. uh, what would be the next step? Do they go to a special kind of laboratory then for this so interpretation? Yep, Walk us through that. You collect your oral fluid sample so the pigs chew on it. You put it in a, like a gallon plastic bag. You squeeze the sample off of the rope and then you would put it in a centrifuge tube or any sort of tube, mm -hmm. place it on ice, and then send it to a diagnostic lab for either PCR testing, ELISA testing, whatever diagnostics you need to run. Uh, to figure out if you've got either an immune response or nucleic acid, so if you have a virus. Um, a lot of people at Iowa State, our most requested test is the PERS-PCR. Our second most requested is the PED-PCR. So a lot of people are using it for PCR and ELISA testing. So now when you're taking samples for this spatial autocorrelation, mm -hmm. uh, are this, what sort of sampling size do you need to get a good handle on a, a particular group of pigs? Let's say if there are a thousand pigs in a barn. Mm -hmm. How many oral fluid samples would you need to take? Uh, that really depends. Your probability of detection depends on your sample size. So how many samples do you take, your prevalence, 
Uh, what's the level of disease in your barn? Is it 10%, is it 25%? And then what assay you would be using, because it depends on your diagnostic test performance. So if you have a pretty good test, like 95% sensitivity, 95 or 98% specificity, then you would look at the tables in a publication that's coming out in the Journal of Veterinary Microbiology, which talks about probability of detection using oral fluids. And if you're, have a, you're on a site, it's 25%, you think you have a 25% disease prevalence, and you want to collect oral fluids, you've got three barns on your site, I would recommend taking four samples per barn, so 12 samples in total. That'll give you a probability of detection of 92% which is a pretty high probability of detection, which means you would only miss it 8% of the time. And again, how do you map this out in terms of spacing? So I recommend doing a fixed spatial sampling approach. So taking your samples equidistant from each other, the length of the barn. So that way each area of the barn is sampled and you get a good representation of what's actually going on in the barn. Now, your work has focused on PERS. Um, have you been comparing like the sampling that you've been getting through this procedure to conventional sampling? We haven't had any um, conventional sampling, sampling or any real world feedback yet. I'm kind of relying on our producers and our veterinarians to go out there once they see the publication, test this out and say, yeah, these, these numbers make sense. If I'm sampling these sample size, I think I have this disease prevalence. I'm getting this probability of detection. Uh, what we did with this study is we used real field data, so we went to a real site, it wasn't a research site, mm -hmm. uh, we, did, we didn't manipulate the herd at all, so what we have is we have this real field data that we then modeled to get this probability of detection, so it's, it's pretty real, real world as it is right now. So what's the goal, what's the, the end game from all of this? Uh, how is this going to help the, the industry get a better handle on PERS? So oral fluids have been around since 2010. And the question has been asked, you know, how many samples do I need to take? Where in the barn should I sample? Mm -hmm. And this is something that, you know, the industry has really been asking for since we've started using oral fluids. And this answers that question of how many samples do you need to take and how should you sample? Right now we have um, different tools, different epi tools to calculate individual sample size based on your disease prevalence and diagnostic test performance, but we don't have that for oral fluids because oral fluids are a different type of sample than individual samples such as serum or nasal swabs. So this answers that question, you know, how can I use oral fluids and how many samples do I need to take to make sure I'm doing enough to detect disease on my site. And what is it about the oral fluids that is so attractive to you as a microbiologist? You feel like you can get a better handle on the situation? Oral fluid samples are easy to collect. It takes about one person to do it. You can go in, you can drop one rope, collect that sample. You only need one person to do it. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Versus serum sample where you'll need at least two people, one to restrain the pig and one person to do the actual blood collection. So mm -hmm. it does take a little bit more time. And then you have to factor and you have to pay that extra person to go in. Sure. So you're paying for the extra person, you're paying for the extra time. Uh, what oral fluids do is they're easier to collect, um, they're a little bit more of an efficient sample, and they're a great screening sample. So you can go in, get a good idea of what's going on in your pen, and then if you get a result that you might not necessarily agree with, or you think you might have something going on in one pen, you can do more targeted testing, like individual mm -hmm. samples, like serum or nasal swabs. So it's not just a matter of more accurate sampling, is this also going to produce a more accurate test? All of our tests depend on what the diagnostic test performance is, so mm -hmm. it depends on what, the test performance depends on what the test is made out of, so oral fluid samples do need to be optimized, or the tests for oral fluid samples do need to be optimized. Uh, we basically take our serum, serum tests and we optimize them, we adapt them for oral fluids. So it doesn't necessarily affect the test as long as the test has been adapted for oral fluids. One last question. I know your focus has been on PERS, but could this kind of testing be used with some other major viral diseases in the pork industry? Absolutely. Oral fluid testing can be used with any pathogen that's either in the environment like PED. Uh, we can detect influenza. We can detect PERS, obviously, uh, PED, swine delta. There's, uh, we're working on getting foreign animal diseases like classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease, mm -hmm. adapting that for oral fluid testing. So anything that's in the serum will be secreted in the oral fluids, we'll be able to detect that, and then anything in the environment we'll be able to use with oral fluid testing. 
Fascinating. Well, thanks for explaining all that. Yeah, no problem. We have been talking to Dr. Marissa Rotolo of the Iowa State University. She is a postdoctoral research associate. Thank you again. Thank you.